Good evening, and welcome to Petaluma Blacks for Community Development's 44th Annual Black History Program. My name is Angela Robinson, and I will be your mistress of ceremony for the evening. The theme of the program is Black Health and Wellness. We have lots to share with you, so let's get started. First, we want to acknowledge being on Native American land. We gratefully acknowledge the Native people on whose ancestral homeland we gather, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who made their home here and in neighboring communities. We acknowledge that the Coast Miwok call this land home before the arrival of others. We recognize them as the original stewards of the lands on which we now live. We will have our invocation by Ryan Oschlager, the head pastor at Petaluma Christian Church. Hello, my name is Ryan Oschlager. I'm the lead pastor of Petaluma Christian Church. My family and I haven't arrived in July of this past year. We're so grateful to be part of the Petaluma and Sonoma County community. Uh, and I'm grateful to be with you guys to pray for this uh, special event. Someone whose uh, life I've recently reconsidered this past month is a man named Lemuel Haynes. Lemuel was the first ordained black preacher in the United States. He was abandoned by his African father and uh, white mother and given over to indentured servitude uh, five months later until the age of 21. After trusting Christ, he would spend most of his adult life serving a white congregation in Rutland, Vermont. And in that congregation, he not only preached the word of God and cared for the people, but he was also a, a staunch advocate for abolition during an early time to do so, and, and an early opponent of Black recolonization, an idea that started to perk up in the 19th century. His name, Lemuel, means belonging to God. This name is only mentioned once in the Bible uh, as the author of a few verses in the Old Testament book of Proverbs, chapter 31. So Pastor Haynes took these words from his namesake as a personal calling from God for his life. And I thought I would read a few of those words. These are words from verses 8 and 9 of Proverbs 31. And these let, then let these words form our prayer. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those who are perishing. Yes, speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. Pray with me if you would. Lord God, thank you for, for men and women like Lemuel, uh, pioneers of, of color who stood up to tyranny and injustice at great personal risk to themselves. Um, we thank you. Uh, men and women who spoke up for those who uh, were poor, were helpless, were uh, not given a voice in their time and place. And Father, we ask that um, you would continue to empower people to fulfill these words we just read, uh, to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, to ensure justice for those who are perishing, speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. May we uh, all be instruments of justice, people of color and those who are not, help us join together and be such instruments uh, for the sake of our fellow man and for your glory. It's in God's name we pray, amen. Thank you again for this opportunity and wishing you every blessing for your meeting tonight. Now, Julie Dormier will lead us in the Negro National Anthem. Feel free to sing along. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise. High as the listening skies, let it resound loud as the rolling sea. 
sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on our way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places our God when we met thee. Lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forgot thee. Shadow beneath thy hand. May we forever stand. True to our God, true to our native land. Thank you, Julie. That was wonderful. The Negro National Anthem, or Lift Every Voice and Sing, was publicly performed first as a poem in celebration of Abraham Lincoln's birthday in 1900. The creators of the anthem are James Walden Johnson and J. Roseman Johnson. In 1919, the NAACP chose it as the Negro National Anthem. Now, Petaluma's mayor, Teresa Barrett, will present Gloria Robinson, my mother, and the founder of Petaluma Blacks for Community Development with a proclamation from the city. Good evening, and uh, I am very happy to be here. I'm Teresa Barrett the mayor of Petaluma, and I'm going to be reading the city of Petaluma's proclamation for Black History Month, February, 2022. Whereas Petaluma Blacks for Community Development was established in 1978 by a group of concerned Black residents to acquaint the community with Black culture and history, to provide support for new Black families moving into the area, and to ensure that the Black community became a positive part of the larger Petaluma community. And whereas Petaluma Blacks for Community Development, in keeping with their goals and objectives, have continuously provided a venue for sharing with the community through an annual Black history program, museum exhibits, and individual members' involvement in various community organizations and activities. The group has continued to provide support for Black families through social gatherings and reaching out to each other. And whereas Petaluma Blacks for Community Development has continuously supported our youth by making them active participants in the organization, encouraging them in their involvement in school and community activities and teaching them to value our history. And now therefore be it resolved that I, Teresa Barrett, Mayor of Petaluma, along with the members of the Petaluma City Council, do hereby acknowledge February 2022 as Black History Month and commend Petaluma Blacks for community development in their effort to support the community at large and provide our city with Black cultural activities and an awareness of Black heritage. And with that, we will give our proclamation to Gloria Robinson. On behalf of Petaluma Blacks for Community Development, I would like to thank Mayor Teresa Barrett and, and the city council members for, for this proclamation and, and their support. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, M Mayor Barrett and Gloria Robinson. Next, we have Jada Reynolds will delight us with an original poem. 
Jada is 12 years old and attends Kinneroth Junior High School. The name of her poem is Climate Gods. The eerie light, a six bright wakes us to climate fight. Stay inside, Papa. At three years old, he knows that smoke can blacken more than what's outside. In all of human history, never have we done such exponential harm. And fingers love to point at parties, but the only thing revealing is how quick we are to judge, as though we aren't all in this together. This party's ours, this planet burns for us, from California to the Arctic to Australia. We've made these clouds. We are climate gods. And if we are the gods, who are we asking to die for our sins? Thank you, Jada. That was beautiful and powerful. New World Ballet will perform a dance to Aretha Franklin's song, Ain't No Way. Victor Temple is the director of New World Ballet in Santa Rosa and he has performed with the Dance Theater of Harlem, Oakland Ballet, and several other dance groups. Let's turn our attention to Tiffany Jimenez, Jimenez as she performs to Aretha Franklin's Ain't No Way.
Bravo, Tiffany, that was great. Thank you and New World Ballet. Each year, the Martin Luther King Committee has a speech contest. And this year, we are fortunate to have one of the contestants. Priscilla Mayahan recite her speech. Priscilla is 16 years old, attends Elsie Allen High School, and is in the 11th grade. Thank you for the introduction. Hope. Hope is the thing with the feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without words and never stops at all. Emily Dickinson. Hope is the power of being able to take a negative situation and convert it into something positive. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, with this faith, we will be able to hew out the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. Yet despair is something that has always existed in society. Racism, negative stereotypes, inequality, COVID-19, the invasion of the Capitol building, climate change, wildfires, poverty, are all problems that unfortunately most of us face today. We know these issues continue to exist, but they never seem to change for the better. Why? Why is it that we cannot change our mountains of despair? That is what I've continually asked myself throughout my own personal life. Why am I unable to get rid of my own hopelessness? For many long years, I suffered from severe depression and anxiety. My small hills of pain became mountains due to my father's domestic violence upon my mom, which led to her hospitalization. His verbally abusive and sexist language to both my mom, my sister, and myself led to emotional scars that long carried and the financial issues that plagued us and throughout my own existence for my whole life. These mountainous problems circulated in my head, leading to all my cutting and suffering, to even therapy and medication. For all my life, I blamed myself for these circumstances, even though I had no control over them as a young child. All of those days and nights blaming myself kept me stuck in that continual dark hole of dread. Even after these threats were no longer a reality in my world, I still found I could not move on from this past. I was stuck in my past trauma and could not find that missing piece of ambition that would allow me the ability to prosper in this new, safer environment. I was stranded on top of my mountain of despair. My mental struggles continued into high school. I poured myself into academics and extracurricular programs, not realizing that there was soon to be a stone of hope to lighten my distress. A summer trip that would give me that missing piece of ambition and would offer me that glimpse of a different perspective of life. This past summer of 2021, I went on a camping trip to Lassen National Park as part of a high school program called Summer Search. One evening out in the wilderness, our group counselor asked each and every one of us to go on a 30 minute solo walk. The task was to bring something we found in nature that would represent who we wanted to be in the future. At first, I did not know what to bring back. It was so hard to contemplate my future when essentially I didn't even know who I wanted to be. But as I began walking in this peaceful quiet of nature with no distractions, I finally had the chance to think clearly about my true self. I started to think about the wounds in my life and if I ever actually recovered from them. In this silence, I realized I had never actually faced my trauma. I never had that actual quiet moment to think about what were the issues that continually weighed me down. Walking with these areas called, in an area called Lower Twin Lake, I was confronted with three white feathers laying near a grassy area, each pointing in a different direction, as if each were pointing a pathway for me. These three white feathers were solely intended for me. Not only did I realize who I wanted to be in the future, but they also helped me find that stone of hope that would lift me to conquering my mountain of despair. I picked up these three white feathers and reunited with the group. When I was asked to share what I found, I explained this. We human beings always see birds as these majestic creatures that soar through the sky, but we never get to stop and think about the struggles they go through every single day tough storms, foraging for food, destruction to the habitat, and invading predators are all different battles that birds confront. Within these, ba these battles, they lose feathers, yet most of the time, they still continue to fly, moving forward with their lives. As I held onto these feathers, I thought to myself, when I'm older, I wanna be just like a bird. I wanna fly no matter how many feathers I lose. I just wanna fly. I wanna be able to lose my feathers just like these powerful creatures and release all of those tough, painful times that were once so, so much a part of me that I thought I could never let them go. 
I now know I can finally move on from my past and create my own future. Just like Martin Luther King Jr. stated in his film and college audience in 1960, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't crawl, then walk. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Like King and his words, I have always been able to move forward in order to find the day's stone of hope. Moving forward in light of distress is something that King would want for each and every one of us. To have hope in our darkest hours allows us to find our feathers in order to improve our quality of life. This may not be easy, but it's important to realize that there is a stone of hope in all of our mountains of despair. So when Martin Luther King Jr. said, with this faith, we will be able to hew out the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. I can personally attest that even with the detection in our lives, we are all capable of one day finding our feathers that have been underneath our wings all along. Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla. That was thought provoking and really wonderful. Now we are going to have some music by Kayetta Patton. Ms. Kay is an educator, poet, songwriter, and lyricist. She was born in Oakland, California, but spent many years in Sonoma County. So now let's hear from Kayetta. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kayetta. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you, Ms. Faith, for uh, having me here today. I'm just gonna share a song off of my album, Beautiful and Messy, entitled uh, Randy Moss. Um, wherever you are, you can bounce with us. Um, so give me a second here. Yeah. yeah. My brother. Hey. One, two, one, two, hey. One, two, one, two, hey. That's right. Yours truly, hey, Akuna Matata, hey, yada, hey, hey, yada. Don't get more straight cash, homie. Money in the bank, cake, 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 cake. Money in the bank, cake, 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 cake. Money in the bank, cake, 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 cake. I got it, got it. T's cross, cross. Cash, homie, cash, homie. Like switch, uh. Yo, I just needed a little work, a little prayer. I just needed a little luck. Yo, I swear it's a gift and a curse. I've accepted this a gift and a curse. Yo, I'm tired of hearing about who's better. Please, this pineapple got this feeling like, yo, whatever. Whatever you say, pick a time, pick a place. City, town, borough, we game, any time, any day. KP, Kanye, pick a game. Giving the truth is you can't spill with cake. Back to the offering, okay. Anyway, Coney Gag, anyway. Chronicles, yo, how that Henny tags, yo. No secret service up in the upper room. Planetary connections, okay. Yeah, that's up to you. They love the culture, but they don't love me. Watch too much TV. Thought I was ugly. And then they found they could capitalize on all the things that held me down. They gave me my crown. And then they pay all these clones and drones to fill the stadiums with crowds. I'm like, wow. My kiki had the way I walk, the way I dress for the consumer. You say it's serving, I don't see the humor. Then water down the product. Me being socially aware when I get my stocks up. I'm steady with slots, taste better with the butter. All these frogs, they get pastas. Wanna be monsters. Tastes better when she's feeding me off the floor. Yo, the sweetness, the completeness. She know we, I'm just speaking. Jedi mind trick, your highness. Classic time. Show. No ghost, rhyme fast. Yo, my steeds at the point of attention is at ease. At ease. Wait, money check, please. My steeds at the point of attention is at ease. At ease. Wait, 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 money check, please. Cha ching, cha ching, that's money. Hey, money check, please. Cha ching, cha ching, that's money. Yo, money check, please. Don't get more straight cash on me. Money in the bank, cake, 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 cake. Money in the bank, cake, 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 cake. Money in the bank, cake, cake, cake. That's cash, that's guap. I mean, we the cream of the crop. Had a dream, it didn't stop. Yo, so food in the pot. That's cash, that's guap. I mean, we the cream of the crop. Had a dream, yo. It didn't stop, stop. Yo, so food in the pot, pot, pot. That's cash, that's crop. I mean, we the cream of the crop. Okay. Thank you, Kayeta. That was wonderful. It was hard to sit still. 
Thank you. Um, our theme this year is Black Health and Wellness. Next, we will hear from Sonoma County's Deputy Health Officer, Dr. Kismet Baldwin, about Black healthcare and COVID-19. At the end, there will be a Q&A as time permits. So to find the Q&A button, look at the bottom of your screen and you should see a cute little Q&A. Type in your question and the host will provide your question to Dr. Baldwin. Thank you. I'm just gonna pull up my screen. All right, so I'm just gonna take uh, a few minutes to review some data from the 2021 portrait of Sonoma and um, some of the data that we've been compiling throughout the pandemic on um, how the black residents uh, have fared during this pandemic in Sonoma County. So the portrait of Sonoma um, looks at the human development index. And this is an index expressed on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being you know, the highest level of well being and access to opportunity. And they take into consideration three main indicators health, education, and earnings. So I think the common theme over this, this short presentation is um, the details. The details matter. So from the first time the Portrait of Sonoma was put out in 2012 until you know, up to 2019, which is the, the time frame for this data, Sonoma County as a whole, um, their, you know, the HDI score has gone up, which is great. We want to get as close to 10 as possible. But when you look a little, you know, deeper into the details, there are two racial and ethnic groups that have actually had decreasing HDI scores. And the black population in Sonoma County is one of those where it has um, sharply decreased from 4.68 in 2012 down to 3.99. And again, that is not the direction we want, we want to see it going. So if we're looking at the indicators that are taken into consideration, life expectancy is one of those. And um, over this time, we've seen that Sonoma County's Black residents have a lifespan of about 10 years shorter than any other racial and ethnic group in the county. But to take into consideration that because the numbers are so small for the uh, Black population in Sonoma County, um, sometimes uh, the numbers aren't as concrete as we'd like. We can't make as strong of a statement, but even if it was five years difference or seven or eight years difference, that's significant. And Black residents of Sonoma County have lower levels of well-being than Black residents of the state of California as a whole and live over three years fewer or less on average than Black Californians. So there's something happening that we really need to, to delve into a little further. Uh, the next indicator is access to education. And um, Black children and young adults in Sonoma County are enrolled in school at a rate six percentage points lower than the Black statewide average. And uh, if you're thinking, well, everyone has to do K through 12, so why would that be? Well, the, the age range is from three to 24. So from three to five, daycare enrollment, and from 18 to 24, college enrollment, those seem to be um, decreased uh, compared to other counties across the state when we're looking at um, black residents. And that also has decreased the overall HDI um, number. And then the third indicator is earnings and um, standard of living. Now the median personal earnings for Black residents in Sonoma County are about $5,600 less than white residents. And Black residents represent about 1.3 to 1.5 percent of the county population, yet they account for 6 percent of the unhoused in recent homeless census counts. And there was a, another um, count this last Friday, so we'll see if any of that changes, but it's disproportionate. It's more people than we would expect for the number of people, Black residents in the county. And all of this, all of these social determinants of health are magnified, these disparities are magnified, have been magnified over the COVID pandemic. I mean, uh, nothing has decreased for sure. And that's what we've been seeing in our numbers. So if we take a look as of 224, what our case rates are, the total county case rate or number of new cases per 100,000 residents per day, was about 24.9. Now that's high, we're coming out of the Omicron surge, but it's coming down. And our hospitalizations are about 42 people hospitalized for COVID, with COVID. But again, if we delve into the details a little further, currently African-American or Black and uh, American Indian and Alaskan Native residents, their 
case rate is 44 new cases per 100,000 per day. That is almost twice as high as the county as a whole. Now, throughout the pandemic, um, that's wavered back and forth. The Latinx population has also um, very frequently had a higher case rate than other races and ethnicities, but currently um, these two groups have the highest case rate. And during the pandemic, Black residents have accounted for 2%, about 2% of all cases, but again, only represent about 1.3 to 1.5% of the overall population. So what is happening? Why is that happening? Same thing for hospitalizations and deaths. In Sonoma County, Black residents have accounted for, again, about 2.6% of hospitalizations for COVID-19 and 2.5% of deaths due to COVID-19. But only represent about 1.3 to 1.5% of the overall population. That's a lot. That why? Why is it that so many of our Black residents are, you know, being hospitalized and dying at a higher rate than, than other races and ethnicities? We've been pushing vaccinations um, since they came out over a year ago. And it time and time again we have seen that the risk of hospitalization and death increases exponentially if you are unvaccinated. So when we look at vaccination status by race and ethnicity in Sonoma County, the black population of residents in the county are the highest proportion fully vaccinated. They have come out, they have turned out and they've gotten vaccinated and that is powerful and it's important. But if you look on the right-hand side at the number of or the percentage of um, the Black residents that have gotten their booster dose, it's much lower. It's about 58%. And that's something we really need to work on. We need to get everyone out to get their boosters because it makes a big, big difference. And this is just showing this. When you look at how effective the COVID vaccines are, and this is across the state of California, if you look at the green line, it's 85 to 90 percent effective for preventing COVID-19 if you're boosted. The green line is boosted. The orange line is being fully vaccinated. You've gotten your two doses of Moderna or Pfizer or your one dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Look at the difference between preventing cases, hospitalizations, and deaths between the boosted group and the, and the group that's been fully vaccinated. It's a big difference. And we've seen this play out in Sonoma County as well, where if you look at the green line, these are the number, the case rates of people who have gotten their booster shot. It's much, much, much lower than the gray line who are the people who've been fully vaccinated. They've done their job. They've gotten their, you know, their, their primary series, but they haven't gotten that booster shot yet. And it's exponentially higher a case rate if you're unvaccinated. And this is played out over and over. So we really need to make a push for all of our um, minority groups and all of our populations to get their booster shots. So. Um, that's a very, very general and brief overview of what we're seeing in Sonoma County. And if I've got time, I'll certainly take some questions. Claudia, are there any questions for Dr. Baldwin? We'll take a couple um, of questions. Yeah, we can take a couple of questions. No one has typed one in yet. So doctor, what is the county doing to encourage, you know, either more people to get boosted or you know, whatever it is that we need to do to bring those numbers down. And what's your thought on, I don't want to get you in any trouble here, but the mask mandate, like, did we end it too soon? Do you see us needing to go back to that? Because um, I know that we're all, not all of us, but many are walking around unmasked, but then the numbers keep going up and down and up and down. Great questions. Uh, first one is we do have um, during COVID, even before I started, because I haven't been in the county that long, um, implemented an equity, health equity group um, and a health equity manager uh, within the COVID section. And we've you know, developed an outreach team and we're making, trying to get out and talk to different community organizations, community groups, um, anybody we can get to. So if we haven't talked to you and you um, have ideas for us, we want to hear it. And um, Maybe uh, before this presentation is over, I'll, I can give my email out and anybody can email me and we can get you connected to our vaccine group because we want to know where we need to be. And we've tried to work with different church groups and organizations and try to be in communities um, that have been most affected during uh, the, the pandemic. But if we're missing a group or we're missing a spot, we want to know so we can try to get there and let people know how to get vaccinated and get their boosters. 
the mask, uh, the mask mandate. I think it, I don't think it was a bad time to actually rescind the mandate. Um, I've actually been pretty impressed by the number of people who are still wearing their masks. Um, I, it's not going to be as many people as we like, but I'm always happy you know, if I go into Target and 85% of the people I'm looking at are still wearing a mask. And I think people are realizing that, you know, you don't need an order to do that. Uh, wear it if you're concerned for yourself, if you're concerned for your family, if you're concerned for others. And I think um, people still are, are, are doing that. And our numbers are still coming down, which is good. Um, could we see a little bit of a bump? We could, uh, we'll see. It takes usually about two weeks to see any major changes after a, uh, like something like the mask mandate is um, rescinded. So I think in general, we're gonna have to learn to live with COVID. It's not going away. It's not gonna be zero. It's not gonna go away. So what are we able to live with and, and, and live our lives, but still try to you know, protect ourselves and how do we do that? And I think that's where we're at in public health, trying to figure out that, that balance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin, for sharing that timely and important information with us. So last year, Paloma Blacks for Community Development started Grapevine Youth Leadership Program. And tonight, we are glad to have some of the youth share with us some hot topics and a couple of poems, so enjoy. Welcome to today's Hot Topics with the Grapevine Youth Leadership Group. We are your hosts, Mia Frey and Isaac Baldwin. And we have some important topics for you today about Black health and wellness. So get ready and don't forget, whatever you learn today, you heard it from the Grapevine. Did you know a significant number of doctors and other medical professionals believe that Black people have a higher tolerance for pain than white people. Let's learn how myths like these and other false beliefs about black health can affect medical needs and affect our health care. Here's our correspondent Hayden with our first hot topic of the night. Bias and myths affecting black health. Thanks Isaac and Mia. It's true. Many myths about black biology and health date back to the 19th century or earlier and still persist today. They can really affect the care that patients receive. Did you know that 40% of first and second year medical students believe that black people have thicker skin than white people? And that black people's blood coagulates slower than white people's. These are both myths that can affect treatment. Other studies have shown that doctors are more likely to rate a black patient's pain lower than a white patient's pain. They are also less likely to provide pain relief treatment for the black patient. The scariest thing is that this happens even with doctors who have positive racial attitudes and they don't realize they have a bias affecting their treatment decisions. What can we do about this problem? Well, we need more education in medical schools and out in the community to bust these myths and to help people be more aware of how this bias can affect healthcare. Having more black representation as doctors and other healthcare professionals will also help not only to make sure these myths are being addressed, but also to make patients feel more comfortable that their needs are being met. If you are in the medical profession, push for these changes. And if you are a black medical professional, consider volunteering for youth programs to encourage the next generation to get into this field. Everyone else, be aware of this bias and spread the word to help fight it. Now on to our next hot topic, Isaac. Did you know that black researchers make up only 3% of medical research facilities despite black people making up 13% of the population in America? Find out how the underrepresentation of black medical researchers and the underfunding of research related to black health affects our health and wellness. Here's our correspondent Layla to help us learn more. Thank you, Mia. That's right. Only 3% of medical researchers are black and that is a major issue for including a black perspective on healthcare issues and getting approval for studies that deal with black health and wellness. Not only are black researchers underrepresented, they're also underfunded. A study in 2011 showed that black researchers are significantly less likely than their white or Hispanic counterparts to receive grant funding from the National Institutes of Health. A follow-up study in 2019 has shown that this has not changed. Less funding and representation leads to less research on black health issues as well as less likelihood of black researchers being promoted in their leadership positions since they aren't getting important funding grants. Another reason why we don't have answers for issues related to black health is underrepresentation of black participants in medical and research trials. 
This is important because studies have shown that people sometimes have genetic differences that affect how they respond to medication and treatments. If we aren't represented, then treatments may not work for us. Underrepresentation of black people in clinical trials is often due to lack of access to the studies and can also be affected by a mistrust of the medical system. However, the medical system needs to try harder and not use that as an excuse. We need black researchers in topics important to black health and wellness to be funded by the NIH and other agencies. More studies on why this is not happening needs to be done and soon, plus greater access to medical studies and respectful, mindful recruitment of black participants for medical trials and research projects needs to happen so that we are represented in treatments that work for us are developed. Get the word out and fight for our rights to have equity in research studies and funding. Thank you. Well, Lena, thanks for that information. Here's our final hot topic of the night. One that is so important for health and wellness. Did you know that black Americans are twice as likely than white Americans to experience feeling of persistent sadness and hopelessness and that dealing with the stress of racism can greatly affect our mental health? Let's hear from Noah and Lilia with more information. Hi guys, yes, black mental health is a huge, super important hot topic after all the stress of the past few years with COVID and those images of the police brutally attacking and igniting the Black Lives Matter movement. Racism, classism, and generational traumas affect black mental health. Black Americans need access to mental health care of black therapists and understand their experiences and provide appropriate care and suggestions. At this time, only 4% of therapists are black. So we are still underrepresented in this field. But the good news is that access to virtual therapy is making it easier for people to connect with people from even far away distances, even if it's not in their area. Thank you guys so much for listening to this conversation. It is so important. And this is a huge issue in our current lives. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Also, there's a history of stigma in black communities that getting help from a therapist isn't something black people do, and it can cause people to avoid reaching out, but this is false. Therapy is important, and there are more and more ways to access it with therapists who can provide the support we need. There are some amazing agencies out there that are trying to make mental health treatment and therapy more accessible to the black community and provide access to black therapists. We have shared some links at the end of our program. Please know you are not alone. Help is available. Back to you, Isaac and Mia. Well, that's all of our hot topics for today. We hope you learn more about important issues in black health and wellness and are fired up to keep fighting for equality and access to health care. And take care of your health as well. Remember, you heard it from the grapevine. And we'll see you next time for some more hot topics. That was great. Thank you guys for that. Remember, the youth designed that video themselves. So next up, we're going to have two poems by two youth that are from the youth from the Grapevine Leadership. Hello, I am Torn with the Grapevine Leadership Group Youth Program sponsored by the Petaluma Blacks for Community Development. This group provides youth ages 11 through 18 in Sonoma County with opportunities to develop leadership skills. In this video, Kaya and Nina will be reading poems that they wrote talking about black people in the medical society. Go to www.pbcdforus.com slash youth dash leadership to join or get more information on the group. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kaya and I wrote a poem. Human, I am human. My body aches, my muscles are sore, my mind tires, my health is fragile. I go to the doctor just like you. I have pain just like you. I have needs just like you. So how come we aren't the same? Why does my prescription differ from yours? Why does my health get measured on a different scale? Why does my mental state get evaluated differently? Why is it that I am human just like you, yet my body is treated differently? Certainly it's not because of my skin, is it? We learned long ago that we are the same people. Human. I am human. Thank you. 
My name's Nina Bobla, and here's my poem. My blackness means my pride. My blackness means my joy. My blackness means my well-being. My ability to do all the things I love. My ability to live. My ability to be free. My blackness means my health, something I control so little over. And what little control I have can be taken away by a racist textbook that says because of my skin color, I can stand more pain that I'm naturally able to be in agony for longer than a white woman. My blackness needs my pride. My blackness needs my joy. My blackness needs my well-being. My blackness means my fear. The fear that when I get older, I won't be taken seriously in a doctor's office because the chances of someone looking like me are slim. 6% of practicing doctors in America are black. Only 6%. My blackness means my pride. My blackness means my joy. My blackness means my well-being. My blackness means suffering from the systemic racism that's built into this country. But my blackness also means my culture. All the great inventors, explorers, and activists that came before me, that will come in the future, and that are in the making. My blackness is what makes me proud to be who I am and who I will become. Thank you. Thank you, Nina and Kaya, for your deep poems. Those were wonderful, very, very awe-inspiring. We were not able to do our exhibit at the museum this year as we had planned, but the Petaluma Library was gracious enough to let us stage an exhibit there. We want to show you a short video of what the exhibit looks like. We hope you will go to the library and spend some time viewing the whole exhibit. The title of the exhibit is Black Health and Wellness. Welcome to the Petaluma Library. Today, we are here to share with you the Black History Exhibit curated by Petaluma Blacks for Community Development, or PBCD. Let's go in and take a look. The theme for this year's exhibit is Black Health and Wellness. The exhibit starts with the root causes of health disparities in African Americans. Our panel starts with slavery and the fact that Africans were treated as property versus humans with systematic or institutional racism leading to many of the other problems that black people face then and still do today. It has been 400 years since the first enslaved Africans arrived in the British colonies, yet the bodies of many black Americans today are still marked by the effects of that horrible institution. African Americans experience much higher rates of poverty, unemployment, and negative health outcomes compared to whites in the US. The intergenerational cultural trauma caused by 300 years of slavery, alongside poor economic circumstances and social prejudice, has led to the poor state of physical, psychological, and social health among African Americans. Jim Crow laws that enforce racial segregation in the South between the end of Reconstruction in 1877 and the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s was based on the theory of white supremacy and a reaction to Reconstruction. The silver lining in this is that Black people, through their self-determination, mutual aid, social support, and activism have accomplished a lot. We have built hospitals, medical and nursing schools, become active in all parts of the health fields and science, inventions and engineering. We have and continue to hold jobs in our US government. We have black scientists who are aerospace engineers, physicists, astrophysicists, robot engineers, and meteorologists and climatologists. Some are included in this exhibit. We have doctors, nurses, and other medical personnel included in the exhibit. So you will see some of the many contributions that African Americans have made despite the many adversities they face. The rise in public and community health information and focusing on body positivity, physical exercise, nutrition, and exploring other dietary options is changing the way African Americans care for themselves. We understand that black health and wellness is not only one's physical body, 
but also emotional and mental health. We are tackling many of the disparities that face us today to build better lives for future generations. We need the help and support of our community and changes in attitude of how we are perceived. To see the complete exhibit and read the stories, go to the Petaluma Library located at 100 Fairground Drive. The hours are Monday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and Tuesday and Wednesday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Closed on Sunday. Thank you. Again, the exhibit will be at the library until March 5th. So please go by to see it. Now, Sharon Diane Henderson will give us a brief history of spiritual songs and will share a couple of songs with us accompanied by her band, Reflection. The Negro spiritual has its origins in the adopted religious practices of 18th and 19th century African people brought to America as slaves. These people were deprived of their languages, families, and cultures, but the masters could not take away their music. The slaves and their descendants adopted Christianity and reshaped it and their music into a way of dealing with their oppression. The earliest spirituals were African-style ring shouts based on simple call and response lyrics chanted against a driving rhythm produced by clapping and foot stomping and participants would shuffle around in a ring formation and shout when they felt the spirit, thus the form ring shout. In addition to worship, the folk songs were sometimes used to communicate with one another without the knowledge of their masters. This was particularly the case when a slave was planning to escape to seek freedom via the Underground Railroad. Songs like Steal Away, Go Down Moses, and Keep Your Lamps are said to have been signals to get ready when the time was near to head out for freedom. The spiritual's emphasis on redemption and deliverance in this world suggests the songs had double meaning for the slaves. They affirmed their belief in the Bible as well as their trust that a just God would deliver them from the evils of slavery. The spirituals are thus seen as expressions of religious faith and resistance to slavery. Now let's take a brief journey through the Negro spiritual. Never was born 
will be honoring us with a gospel and jazz concert tomorrow at the Petaluma Historical Library and Museum. They will perform at 3 p.m. and again at 5 p.m. There are tickets still available at the door. They will be back later in this program to share with us about gospel music. Thank you, Sharon, that was wonderful. If your children aren't watching the program, you might wanna call them in now. We have a special treat for the, them. Tyrell Zimmerman will read his children's book, Carter, My Dream, My Reality. Mr. Zimmerman is a former professional American football defensive lineman who now advocates for disadvantaged and at-risk youth. Hello everyone, my name is Tyrell Zimmerman and I am the author of Carter, My Dream, My Reality. Good morning, Carter, Carter's mom said loudly, but no one answered. Carter, 
Who are you? She said, looking around. It's time for school. She looked all around his room, high and low. She even looked in his closet. Carter was nowhere to be found until finally she looked under the bed. Carter, why are you hiding under your bed? And why aren't you getting ready for school? Carter poked his head out slowly. I don't want to go to school, mommy. I don't want to go. What do you mean you don't want to go to school, mom asked? Because I have dreams of being rich one day so I can take care of you, mommy. Since daddy left us, there's no one to take care of us. So I have to take care of us. Carter, that is so sweet of you, honey. Mom sighed. But in order for you to take care of us, you have to go to school and get an education so you can go to college and become a famous football star or basketball star like you've always dreamed about. But if I go to school, then that means I have to go outside, Carter mumbled. I don't want to go outside. It's scary out there. It's not scary out there. Don't worry, Mom chuckled. The big bad wolf or the boogeyman won't get you. I promise. Mom, if it was just the boogeyman or the big bad wolf, I could make them go away in my head because they ain't real, said Carter. But what's really real and really scary are the things I see out my window every day. That's why I need my gun. Boy, you don't need no gun. You hear me? Mom shouted, shaking her head. And you better not let me hear you say that or see you do that again. Yes, I do. I do, Mommy, said Carter. You have to believe me. It's scary out there. How so, asked Mom. Tears began streaming down Carter's face. Because when I look out my window, what's really real and really scary is when I think about those planes flying into the buildings, I can see out my window. What's really real and what's really, really scary is all the rules for everyone in the whole world are made by important guys wearing suits. And when I go to school, other kids bully me and my friends for no reason. They bully my best friend Alejandro because he's from Mexico and he doesn't talk and look like the rest of the kids at my school. That's what's scary. What's really real and really scary is when I see a bunch of people sleeping outside on the street in the cold with no family and no food, with people walking right past them. And when they get thirsty, they get a drink from outside and the water's brown and dirty and it makes everyone sick. What's really real and really scary is when I hear guys hurting each other for no reason in the middle of the night. What's really real and really scary is when people keep going into buildings and schools like mine and hurting other people for nothing, or when those people keep doing those drugs that make them sick. What's really real and really scary is that the good cops help people and the bad cops might hurt people. What's really real and really scary is that all the kids I play with at my school don't have a daddy, just like me, mommy. Who's going to protect them and their mommies? Mommy, it's really, really scary out there. Carter, you know what's really real and what's really scary? Said mom in a stern voice. You holding your hands like a gun. You're right. There are a lot of scary things happening out there in the world today. But one day, 
you'll be a very important and successful man. And all of the young people will listen to you and respect you, like your friends who want to be teachers. And you better teach them the right way to handle scary things. Show them that they can be whatever they want to be when they grow up. If you do, you'll make a difference in this world. Now go and get dressed and get ready for school. Carter stood in silence. Mommy, you really think I could make a difference in this world one day? Look at me, Carter. You don't have to be scared. You don't have to be afraid. You're not like the people you hear and see out there. You're different. You're special. And most of all, I love you very much. You're my hero, said mom, smiling broadly. I am? I'm your hero? Asked Carter. Yes, Carter. You are my hero, said mom. And remember, your dream is your reality. One day, if you work hard enough, your dream will become your reality. And then you'll be able to do great things. You will even change the world. The end. Thank you, Mr. Zimmerman. Petaluma Blacks for Community Development will be providing one of Mr. Zimmerman's books for each of the elementary schools in Petaluma. They will be sent out to the schools soon. Next, more on health and wellness. We have a short video created by Black Church Food Security Network. We know that food insecurity is and how it can affect people living in poverty but also causing people to make incorrect or unhealthy food choices. This video shows one way Black churches and farmers are coming together to solve the problem of food insecurity. Hi, my name is Reverend Dr. Heber Brown III, and for the past decade, I have been working with African-American congregations and Black farmers. We do this under the banner of our organization called the Black Church Food Security Network. We were born in 2015 in the middle of the Baltimore uprising. While demonstrations and protests were going on all over the city, we were working to advance food justice because we recognized that no justice, no peace also links to a piece of the pie and power over your plate. Baltimore city government backed up off of these communities. Nonprofit organizations backed up in the middle of the uprising. Support that we needed was just not there. We realized in that moment that charity had failed us. It was time for us to do something for ourselves. I started calling around to my farmer friends and my pastor friends. We brought church and farm together to create a black-led food system. Utilizing the resources of our churches, we began to feed ourselves. What started out just at one church now has spread across the country. Historic African-American congregations all over the United States have linked with the Black Church Food Security Network in order to advance food sovereignty in our community. The Black Church Food Security Network specializes in partnering with historically African-American congregations for community empowerment. We do this through our two major programs, Operation Higher Ground and the Soil to Sanctuary Market. Through Operation Higher Ground, we help churches expand or establish community gardens. The Soil to Sanctuary Market is where we partner with Black farmers to sell fresh produce and church-owned dining halls, parking lots, and multi-purpose rooms. So yeah, we transform church spaces into many farmers markets to sell produce directly to black communities. We believe that you can't get a handle over your health until you have power over your plate. We believe that it's time for us to do what we need to do for ourselves and our community. Remember this point from the video. You can't get a handle on your health until you have power over your plate. 
That's really powerful. We will have Sharon Henderson grace us again with her beautiful voice and accompanied by her band Reflection with a history of gospel music and some songs. In the 20th century, spirituals evolved into the more urban New Testament centered gospel songs. Following the first great migration of Southern African Americans to urban centers like Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia in the post-World War I years, the new genre of Black American sacred songs known as gospel began to appear. Unlike the anonymous folk spirituals, gospel songs were composed and copyrighted by songwriters like Thomas Dorsey and the Reverend William Herbert Brewster. Now by the 1930s, gospel songs were being recorded by urban church singers like Mahalia Jackson, the Dixie Hummingbirds, and the Ward Singers. But most gospel singing remained rooted in African American church ritual and to this day can be heard in black communities throughout the United States. Musically, gospel is a blending of spirituals, blues, and the song sermons of the black preacher. Lyrics are most often New Testament centered, focusing on the redeeming power of Jesus and the singer's personal relationship with the Savior. Although gospel lyrics are mainly religious in nature, Gospel music derives much of its sound from blues and jazz. Likewise, gospel music has been a source for various secular styles, including early rock and roll, soul music, and most recently, gospel rap. During the civil rights era, the melodies of old spirituals and gospel songs were used with new lyrics, expressing the need to overcome Jim Crow segregation. Now let's take a look and listen to old and new gospel music.
but thy will be done. There is no more I, but you, the Christ that lives inside. Lord, I give my everything, my everything to you. I'm yielded completely through and through. All I want to say is yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. From the bottom of my heart to the depths of my soul. Yes, Lord. Completely yes. My soul says yes. With one accord, every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. to our God every word of worship with one accord every praise every praise is to our God sing hallelujah to our God glory hallelujah is to our God every praise every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to is to our God. Don't forget that Sharon and her band Reflection will be at the Petaluma Historical Library and Museum for two shows tomorrow. There is still time to get tickets. Now, Natalie Rogers, who is the first Black City Council member in Santa Rosa, will provide us with a presentation on behavioral and mental health. And if time permits, at the end, we will have a Q&A session. And you can recall that the Q&A button is on the bottom of your screen. Hello, thank you for having me tonight. I come to you with a very short but purposeful message um, provided by Sonoma County Black Mental Health Needs and Supports. Um, my name is Natalie Rogers. I am the first African-American uh, female uh, Vice Mayor for the City of Santa Rosa. So thank you very much. Next slide, please. Black adults in the U.S. are more likely than white adults to support, to report persistent symptoms of emotional di distress, such as sadness, hopelessness, and feeling like everything is an effort. Only one in three will receive help. Barriers such as socioeconomic, stigma and provider bias and inequality of care um, <clears throat> prevent people from going to uh, receive services. 
Um, and this is something that I heard a lot of um, some of the children addressing when they gave their presentation um, about the inequities in healthcare services that are being provided. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Black people are 3.5 times more likely to be incarcerated in jail and nearly five times more likely to be incarcerated in prison nationwide. More than one quarter of people in jail meet the threshold for serious psychological distress and nearly 50% have been diagnosed with a mental illness. Evidence suggests people of color in the justice system are less likely to be screened, diagnosed, or treated for mental health issues. Formerly incarcerated people are nearly 10 times more likely to be homeless and lack of housing can significantly worsen mental health problems. Um, and this is definitely something that we are seeing um, around Sonoma County right now with the, the lack of housing um, and the rise in mental health. Next slide, please. Depression and anxiety are more common among Black and Latinx individuals during the pandemic. Facing elevated risk of exposure, hospitalization, death, financial impacts, and loss of loved ones. Um, so I wanted to take a, a few, few seconds on this slide. Um, I know I wasn't given a lot of time, um, but depression and anxiety are, are two things, um, are two diagnoses, I would say, that are provided to people that go to work every day um, and they find themselves not motivated uh, with the depression, not wanting um, to get up, uh, not doing things that they normally um, have done. Uh, the anxiety uh, in people of color, uh, I see it a lot in women of color where we just push, 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 we push on, we push on, we take on a lot. And we may not feel where we will think that we are anxious per se, but we will get the symptoms within our bodies. Um, we'll start to feel pains within our bodies that are unexplainable. Um, and we go to the doctors, they don't know what it is. Um, that very well can be anxiety. Um, so please be mindful uh, if, if you don't have a, a diagnosis for it or if the doctors can't figure it out and you know that you can be under um, a tremendous amount of stress, uh, it, it could be um, contributed um, through mental health. So next slide, please. Among Black residents, drug overdose deaths were five times higher in 2020 than the average in 2017 through 2019. Drug overdose deaths increased by 82.5% in 2020 as compared to the prior three-year average. The number of drug overdose deaths in 2021 has already surpassed that of 2020, and the data is not yet final. So this is definitely, um, definitely not good. Uh, people within our community are using drugs in order to, to cope. They're using it as a coping skill. And um, it is not a, it's not a coping skill. So we need to make sure that we take the stigma of uh, treatment away um, and that we encourage people to get treatment. We encourage people to be providers um, because it is something that we, we need in our community. Next slide, please. While overall national suicide rates decreased in 2020, some states reported an increase in suicides among black residents, particularly youth. Among Sonoma County has the second highest youth suicide rate in the ninth county Bay Area, just behind Solano County. Over 25% 
of multiracial youth, 23% of Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander youth, and 21% of Black youth, and 19% of white youth in Sonoma County report having considered suicide. Um, and I can tell you, having worked in the ER, a lot of our youth, um, and I'm not sure why, and I, and I say youth, but I, a lot of our youth, that is their go-to. And um, we need to be able to sit down and talk to them. Um, and we need to listen. And we may not agree, but we need to be able to listen to them. Um, because if we're not listening to them, we can't hear how they're feeling. So we can't really provide them with the tools that they need in order to keep going. Um, and so I just feel like it's really important that uh, we start to listen as a community more to what their, what their needs are so that we can address those needs. Uh, next slide, please. These are some supports that we have within Sonoma County for not only people that are dealing with uh, mental health and behavioral health, but also families and how do you support your family members um, when they are uh, dealing with behavioral health issues and problems. So I think we have a little bit of time for some Q&A. Thank you, Natalie. Um, we're gonna hold on Q&A and if you could, um, if anybody did have any questions, we'd appreciate you sending them in and we'll get your email address and we'll get them connected and you can respond back to them. So thank you very much, Natalie. So in 1966, Dr. Mulana Karinga, a professor of African studies at CSU Long Beach created Kwanzaa, a celebration of African-American culture from December 26th through January 1st. There is a different principle for each day of the celebration. Today, we want to share with you a Kwanzaa dance that was created by Culture Queen. She is an African-American award-winning performer and educator who teaches through music and dance. Now, everyone get up, get and get ready to have fun and learn a new dance. Yeah, 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 yeah. Happy Kwanzaa, happy Kwanzaa, happy, 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 happy Kwanzaa. Come on everybody and show your pride, do the Kwanzaa slide. Seven is the magic number, yeah, it's Kwanzaa time. Family, culture, community. Yeah, you know the vibe. Party don't stop seven days and nights. Do the Kwanzaa slide. Take it to the left. Put your fist up high and turn it all around. Take it to the right. A rock side to side and shake it down to the ground. Just slide and then stop. Slide and then stop. Slide, slide, slip and slide. That's right. Do the Kwanzaa slide. You're cordially invited to the party of the year. Come on, come on, it's a family affair. Dress to impress in your red, black, and green. Looking like African kings and queens. Do you know what Kwanzaa means? It means first fruits in Swahili. Habari Ghani. What's the news? Meet, Meet us on, on the, the floor, floor with your dancing shoes. Come on, everybody, and show your pride. And do the Kwanzaa slide. Seven is the magic number. Yeah, it's Kwanzaa time. Family, culture, community. Yeah, you know the vibe. Party don't stop seven days and nights. Do the Kwanzaa slide. Take it to the left. Put your fist up high and turn it all around. Take it to the right. A rock side to side and shake it down to the ground. Just slide and then stop. Slide and then stop. Slide, slide, slip and slide. That's right. Do the Kwanzaa slide. Unity, purpose, self-determination Starts with your family and then with the nation You gotta have faith and creativity Collective work, responsibility Cooperative economics is a topic, is a topic Or how you spend the money in your pocket, in your pocket Do the Kwanzaa slide, just rock it Whatever you do, just don't stop it Take it to the left Put your fist up high and turn it all around Take it to the right A rock side to side and shake it down to the ground Just slide and then stop Slide, and then stop. Slide, slide, slip and slide. That's right. Do the Kwanzaa slide. Come on, everybody, and show your pride. Do the Kwanzaa slide. Seven is the magic number. Yeah, it's Kwanzaa time. Family, culture, community.
Come on, everybody, and show your pride. And do the Kwanzaa slide. Seven is the magic number. Yeah, it's Kwanzaa time. Family, culture, community. Yeah, you know the vibe. Party don't stop seven days and nights. Do the Kwanzaa slide. Queen, and I'm on the scene today with your boy Fuge. Yes, and we are here to show you how to do the, the Kwanzaa, Kwanzaa slide. slide. And we've invited a couple of royal friends to come show us how. All right, first we're gonna do. We're gonna take it to the left. Put your fist up high and turn it all around. Then take it to the right. A rock side to side and shake it down to the ground. Then slide and then stop. Slide and then stop. Slide, 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 slippity slide, slide, that's right. Do the Kwanzaa slide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, you got it. Let's do it again. Let's try it one more time, but a little bit faster. Y'all ready? Okay. One, two, three. Take it to the left. Put your fist up high and turn it all around. Take it to the right. A rock side to side and shake it down to the ground. Just slide and then stop. Get yeah, slide and then stop. Slide, slide, slippity slide, that's right. Do the Kwanzaa slide. Yeah. Hey, we got it. You know what will hype this up even more? When you do your Kwanzaa slide, I want you to come dressed to impress. To impress. Wearing your red, black, and green. Because red stands for the blood, and black stands for the people, and green stands for the land. Happy Kwanzaa! I hope you enjoyed learning that new dance. I want to thank you for joining us tonight, and I have enjoyed being your mistress of ceremony for this evening's program. I am now turning it over to Faith Ross, the president of Petaluma Blacks for Community Development, who will provide closing remarks and close out the program. Good night. Thank you, Angela. And um, thank you for being our mistress of ceremony today. The program I thought was great. I want to uh, take a few minutes just to thank a few people. But first of all, I want to recognize that we have been doing this for 44 years. This is our 44th anniversary. Um, I want to thank our committee that worked on the, the program. Uh, it's Bunny Allen, Claudia De La Pena, Anthony Franklin, Steve Delu. Sarah Rainey, Gloria Robinson, Teresa Taylor King, Connie Williams, Lou Zwyer, and Steve Della Magario. I'm not pronouncing his name right, I know that. But anyway, I do want to say a special thank you to Lou, Connie, and Sarah for really making this program happen. They are the glue that makes it work. So thank you so much. They are the IT or whatever you want to call them, people that have helped it. Thank Angela for being able to be here tonight and be our mistress of ceremony. I also want to uh, say a thank you to our, um, our, to our sponsors, the City of Petaluma, Petaluma Healthcare District, Petaluma Health Center, and the Sonoma County Library for allowing, you know, for just being there with us, for helping us with this. And also thank you to our participants and all our wonderful donors that keep us funded. I also wanna make one more thing and talk about Gloria for just a second. Gloria received a, an award this, this last week, actually it was Friday at the Democratic Club's uh, Craft League and it was the Bob Trowbridge uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. And I wanted to make sure that everybody got a chance to, to know that. And so with that, I'm closing out the program. I hope you enjoyed it. And we hope to have it up on our website uh, within a couple of weeks. Thank you so much to all of the people who participated in this program. Good night.